Hi, Sap. Thank you so much for. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Um, it's nice Sunday morning in uh, New York. Um, so New York things are coming back. So exciting. The uh, times at this moment. But yeah, I'm happy to chat with you, Jatin. Long time. I'm, I'm so excited to have you here, Sap. For people, just a quick introduction about Sap. Sap has uh, played very senior, very uh, significant leadership roles in a diverse range of consulting firms, and he was a partner at Boston Consulting Group. Right now, um, Sap is managing a hundred million dollar PNL, works out of New York, and is a graduate from Darden. Graduated roughly twelve years ago, and uh, Sap people are going to get a lot of value from this conversation from you today. I hope so. I hope so. I'm humbled and very privileged that you invited me. So thank you, Jatin. Thank you. Thank that. you for coming up, uh, Sap. So my first question for you is, uh, Sap, you worked for ZS Associates, Booz Allen. You have worked at BCG in, as a partner. And and uh, can you break it down for us? What does a Harvard Wharton Darden grad? What do they do in consulting in the first year of their management consulting career? Like we know the theoretical version of it. People go through the websites, we understand. But how does it look like for the first two years? I think um, it depends uh, on the consulting firm. So, um, you know, uh, I was at Booz and Company, which is called Strategy and now, which is part of PwC. Um, I think in a ZS, which does more of a marketing sales operation, um, it's, those are repetitive uh, cases. So they are, they, they are less, you know, the typical consulting where you have a problem question and you come, come in and kind of think of different ideas. So um, um, associate or a consultant, whatever the consulting firm uses the name, they will come in and, you know, run that small portion of their project, right? And it will be every other month, they will uh, report into the manager and really discuss. Now at a booth company uh, and um, at BCG, uh, you would be given a module of the bigger strategy question. So let's say it's, um, you know, the company is trying to enter a new market and, you know, there are different kinds of things you need to look at, maybe external customers or competition. You have to look at internal capabilities and you will be given one piece of the module and you will actually analyze it, look at the data, interact with the client, um, really run um, with the analysis, right? Uh, the analysis, obviously, from when I started in consulting into the, you know, I was in consulting prior to business school, is very different than now. The data sets are much bigger. You have analytical teams, which you coordinate with uh, across the world. Sometimes they sit in India, to be honest. And uh, you really run like these little models. And then your job is to take those insights and then present uh, to your manager. So the, f- uh, the first year, you're more guided by the engagement project leader. Um, then, you know, taking initiative and saying like, okay, I'm going to do these, these, these things more is like, okay, you have this module, you, you own it, uh, and you need to do it over the next two, three, four, whatever the timeline of the project is. So that's typically what it is. And it, it is a lot about learning how that firm, uh, develops its analysis and presents to the client. So, um, it's constantly questioning, asking, learning, uh, there is, they are generally training programs within these consulting firms to um, get you up and running. So, so that's what, what the first year would look like. Sap, just to follow a question here, when you say that first years get to work with clients as well, uh, at what seniority within the client groups do fresh MBA graduates get to work with? Do, do, do they get to work with CEOs, CFOs, or are they more reporting to other senior managers? Um, it depends. Uh, to, again, you know, I know it's a very consulting kind of answer. Uh, it depends on the firm. So if you had a BCG or a McKinsey or a Bain, yeah, it's a fairly senior because uh, every consulting firm under the sun, um, uh, you know, maybe Deloitte, BCG, McKinsey, BWC, EY, they have everything, strategy from operation. The type of question which is being asked is depending on the, uh, they have different price points. Right, a, a BCG consultant is uh, four hundred dollars an hour, and uh, Ernst and Young is a uh, two hundred dollars an hour. That drives the question, and who's asking? Because your 
you, you have the budget. So in a BCG McKinsey uh, Bain kind of place, you would have the C-suite asking the question, and then you would work as an associate, you know, C minus one, C minus two, C minus three, that kind of thing. You would be present in maybe a final deliverable meeting with your principal partner and engagement manager. You may not talk much, you may be taking <laughs> notes, but you, you may be present in that to see the dynamics because it is important for you to learn what kind of questions do the C level, what kind of messaging works with the team. And because you're closest to the data, they always want you there just in case there's a tough question uh, or a you know oddball which the the partner who doesn't know the answer uh they will need you to kind of get that done from you so um yes it it kind of depends on uh, the firm to be honest okay awesome um my next question for you is sap i've seen a lot of applicants so so we work with applicants who want to go to top mba programs across the world and i've seen a lot of people pick consulting goals on the b school essay now do you think it is a cliche? Like how can one make it more connected? How can one, somebody show more focus while picking up manager consulting as a career? Is it more advisable for people, let's say somebody coming from a manufacturing vertical to express that they want to work within the manufacturing vertical of the consulting firm? Or is it okay to pick up specialized industry groups while picking up consulting on your essay? Or should one focus on becoming more generalist? And I'm asking from the perspective of both the business school and the consulting firms, like what are they most comfortable with? Um, so, first of all, consulting as a career is a very hard. Is that my long term career is to be a partner at a consulting firm? Uh, that is extremely bad answer to pick. The, re- the reason why is because. Consulting is such a highly competitive uh, uh, life, right? Investment banking consulting is highly competitive. 20% of your class ever gets cut, right? They get, they are asked to leave uh, because it's a very up or out kind of system. So the for people who are even partners and managing director, if you, they, they would not have said, I wanted to be a partner, managing director in a consulting firm. They, you know, they started keeping the promotion. They started keeping on. They didn't have, they didn't see any alternatives. They liked the job. They didn't see any alternatives to be out there. And that's why, how they've become, you know, the, uh, you know, partners at uh, these firms. So, so uh, what is a better way to kind of think about is what does the consulting kind of skill set le- helps you to get to? So uh, let's say you want to, you are in manufacturing and you want to change your, um, uh, your background or you want to, see different things uh, or different kind of industries, consulting uh, creates that opportunity. Because if you are in a top consulting firm, uh, most more likely than not, other than maybe a couple of them, will make you a generalist uh, in the first two years. And they will make you cycle through different kinds of projects, different kinds of uh, industries and experiences, because that makes you a better consultant, because you can leverage the different uh, knowledge across the board. So I would, uh, you know, um, for a manufacturing person, you could say, you know, I, I, my first goal is to be in consulting because it is a great way to learn different skill set and change my profile so that I can do maybe X, Y, Z, a different thing. I want to be an entrepreneur, but, uh, you know, I, I, I really don't know the different aspects of businesses. It's a good extension of the biz, uh, business school thing. So if you model your answer and thinking around that, that is a better way. If you say, I want to be a partner at a consulting firm, everyone will laugh at it because they know that it's impossible for you to predict that. And the smartest of the people get culled, right? It's, it's such a difficult profession. Okay. And uh, who do you think is not a great fit on paper for a consulting firm? Like if somebody has a MBB on their, on their essay and somebody has a Mibain BCG McKinsey on their essay, is there any kind of filter that the schools or consulting firms use based on their uh, number of years of work experience or based on their backgrounds where they say, you know what, you're not a great fit? Uh-uh. So um, I think uh, using, first of all, writing a certain firm, MBB, is, is such a, it's like picking a lottery, right? And saying, I'm going to be at MBB. So 
who knows how you're going to be there. Uh, even the, you know, the case interview is such a tough, um, you know, way to gauge people. You may or may not be successful. So if you, even if you're writing consulting, writing a specific firm is, you know, there are 100,000 people apply and 2,000 people get in, right? Across the, uh, across the country or the world. So that's, that's uh, even worse odds than I am. So like, yeah. you shouldn't write that. Um, second is you have to have an analytical bent or either you show through your GMAT that you, uh, you are good at math or some kind of thing, or you show uh, like your very high GMAT score, right? If you have 730, 750, 780, yes, that completely shows that you can do math and that's a good analytical gauge. If you are not good at analytical, then you should have some coursework you should pick up to show that you can show, uh, do these analytics, or data analytics in business school, or you know they have now data science classes. Uh, if you don't have that analytical, then you will get ruined crushed in in consulting because it's so much data coming at you at such a fast pace and you have to make very quick decisions uh, both in the case interview and in in actual work so so if you don't have that bend the analytical bend you can't fake it it's super hard and you know going through the interview process <laughs> and being in the in the firm so so if yeah then consulting is not something for you you should do something else and the thing is, to be honest, as business schools and professions are changing with technology, uh, I think you should develop an analytical. It's, it's a learned method, right? So you, if you're going to business school, get that analytical bend because even marketing and sales has changed, right? It's not about just messaging. It is looking at data uh, now. And then, you know, social media and Facebook and how many clicks and who's looking at what and how can I message it better in that sense? It's all now data analytics. So that becomes a kind of a sustained skill you should have. But if you don't have that skill, forget about consulting. It's just, uh, it, it's not, you're not even going to get in. And people will read your essay and think about, yeah, it's not there. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question related to what I know about your experience as uh, NMB school. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious to ask about, it's related to your interviewing skills. And I know uh, that getting into consulting is a completely a very competitive game. And I know that mm -hmm. uh, you were recruited by a consulting firm for internships. You ditched them. You said no to them. You're saying, you know what? Uh -uh, I'm not coming. And you came back in the second year, convinced them to hire you for the full-time position, which for me and a lot of other people was unheard of. Share the mm -hmm. secret, Sap. What is, uh, <laughs> share the secrets of a great interviewing skill set. How did you do it? So, what did you tell them? So, I think, <laughs> so uh, a couple of things. So, Jatin, you and I were, if you remember, and this is 13, 14 years ago, we both were selected for that, you know, uh, Danaher <laughs> operation thing. And I, I remember sitting at 2 a.m. after working the whole day at the factory <laughs> uh, and working with you and doing case practice. Um, the one of the aspects which um, I got super lucky and maybe something which you should take forward for everyone is uh, because we were late to the game in consulting, because we were working through the war winter break, if you remember, right, in that internship uh, by the professor, operations professor. When I came back to business school, a lot of these groups were formed, like these, you know, four or five first years who are going through the case practice. And I was able to, uh, you know, work with the second year. The people who had already gone through the interview process had offers from consulting firms to learn the case method. Actually, it was better to do that now on the hindsight uh, than actually working with the first years because the first years have never gone through it. So whoever is commenting on your case method, it, it doesn't know anything. So it's like blind leading the blind. So in the, you know, getting that second year really helped me to convert all those consulting interviews because they were very, very, you know, they spent time. I, I took their advice. and Now, once I got to the firm and I went to one firm and I did not, I actually did not stop interacting with them. I, I kept on uh, update, like, this is what I'm doing. These are the reasoning why I'm doing it because I, I think I have something to do. And, and I kept on the channel with the recruiters saying that, listen, 
I am saying no, it is not no to you. I just feel like I need to experiment with this a little bit. And, and so that kind of constant conversation, it was not like, oh, I, uh, I didn't get into this firm and I'm going to go, uh, now I'm going to reach out to you because you are my last. It was not that. It was, you know, the whole, because, you know, uh, in US, it's all about networking, right? And you are all about building those relationships. And, and the worst thing you can do, and that's the worst thing you can do through your you, career, because right now, like a pandemic, is, a, is, is to you contact people when you need them. Contact people constantly and keep that relationship going. So I would send, like I would read something in somewhere and to the recruiter, I would send, uh, or the, uh, the partners who I'd worked with, oh, I read this about your firm, uh, seems very interesting. Uh, oh, I saw this. And I, I, I remembered one of the cases you had given me, right? So that kind of relationship helped me to go back. And I've actually bypassed in some cases of, to straight to the final round because they already had seen me go through and then got, uh, helped me to get that offer, which was obviously, you remember, we graduated in 2008, <laughs> which was a huge blessing uh, uh, in terms of relationship building. So, but you should do that through your career, right? Uh, because never uh, like you don't know what life is going to throw at you right so so you always keep those relationships even if you take like after business school you take some offer and you had let's say uh, like you and i had like danaher was there right which was a general management may not have been the right role for us after business school but three four years after consulting maybe a great role to be in a general management or industrial company keep that those open keep talking so that uh, when the right opportunity comes, the right timing comes. Because remember, the companies also want talent, right? And uh, they are, uh, it's, it's, it's a two-way street. You both are trying to impress each other. It's not like in India, you go, uh, you know, in IM, you go and it's like first day, second day, zero day, you don't apply and you just, you, know, you interview and then gone. Uh, you never build a relationship. U.S. is a completely different ball game in that sense. So the relationships matter and will matter throughout your career. Tell me one thing. Um, uh, you're currently now working in general management, right? You worked in mm-hmm. consulting for seven years, Sap? I worked in consulting prior to business school also. So about 12 years approximately right. together. Yeah. Okay. And then right now you're managing a PNL worth a hundred million dollars, right? Now, a lot of people mm-hmm. started with companies such as uh, JNJ or uh, UTC in their leadership development program and moving mm-hmm. again towards becoming the general managers or taking on operational leadership roles. How do you think working in consulting prepared you for a very different mindset as compared to like if you started in JNJ or if you started in a Fortune 500 company, how would these two meet? in 2016, 2017, how would the learning curve and the growth path be different? Um, yeah, the growth path actually would be very different. A, a because uh, consulting is, is an accelerated career path, right? So what it does is you jump, because you are always moving from case to case, case to case, um, researching new kinds of ideas, and it is a constant uh, kind of, uh, you know, new things happening to you, whatever you do in 10 years in like a corporate role, you will be doing it in five years, if, if not less. So, so uh, organizations, when they are hiring you, they recognize that. So for example, someone who is in J&J development, they will become manager, associate director, director, senior director. You may get directly hired as a senior director after five years of consulting, okay. right? Uh, so that helps you to jump those parts. Now, one of the things uh, what consulting teaches you is the pure analytical skills, looking at a big picture, looking at a macro level, look, and then taking it down to a micro level. That is a helpful skill across the board, whatever career you choose to go into, right? Um, because it's a constant of looking at, and you have to constantly moving into what is the CEO really thinking about and going for the board, and how does my little work ladder up to that question, right? So that, that helps you. That, is, uh, that has definitely helps you even when you move into a general management to learn the business. Because 
you know, I, I came, I had healthcare background, but I had no idea about you know, surgery centers, how primary care physicians work. And that's kind of where I work in the healthcare space. So because of that, you know, constantly learning new information, being analytical and understanding the business, at least from understanding the business, it helped me a lot. What consultants don't have and uh, is, is that we are not, or consulting doesn't teach you the leadership skills which are required from um, uh, for, uh, in, a, in a general management role. Because when you're leading, like ultimately it doesn't matter I manage a $5 million p l or $100 million p l or 10 million, it's all about leading a team, right? A team yeah. which is constantly with you doesn't change over a period of time because in consulting you can change your team, right? Your case team changes every time, even as you go and who is available, right? To do the work. Um, so the leadership piece is very important and you have to constantly learn and you have to have the open mind uh, to learn those because that consulting doesn't teach you. And But if you can imagine, if I had to learn the business and the leadership skills at the same time and become a better leader, those, that would have been a very tough ask from any human because um, you, know, you can only concentrate on one big task yeah. at a time. So, so that, that consulting aspect of learning that, and then now it's more about, you know, how do I refine my leadership skills? How do I, you know, look at bigger problems as I'm climbing in the organization uh, or, you know, sitting on with the CEOs and CEOs of my company, I uh, think to, talking that language, because now that at least they know how, I know how to run the business. So they are also willing to listen. If you go through a leadership program, you slowly build up to that position and you, you, the access. Because when you are a leadership development program, you know, in J&J, you're not going to talk to the CEO. Um, let's say Alex Gorski is the CEO of J&J. You're not going to uh, talk to him. He will may come in and welcome you into the company. But by the time you really have a conversation with him or ever sit next to him is going to be, you know, 10, 15 years down the line. I have been very fortunate to, you know, be in a, on a project and sit and hear what Alex Gorski has to say and his mindset. That is an invaluable lesson uh, which can help you go through the uh, organization. And sometimes that's why consultants, if you play it right, can accelerate uh, through the, if they can get their leadership skills figured out, they can really accelerate through a company and get to a senior level at a very young age uh, compared to someone going through a development program. A follow-up question, Zap. Uh, and it's a very, very valid point. Somebody working in an execution-driven environment versus somebody working in an advisory role in a consulting firm for seven years. And, and you see that there's a gap of somebody not leading, n- not having an exposure to leading a very diverse and a, a significant name. How does one make up for it for the, in the first two years? Like what challenges do consultants face when they move into a general management position for the first two years? And what, how, what do they do to make up for it? Um, How do you learn that leadership skill set? Yeah. I think um, uh, what consulting in some ways teaches you is um, you don't know a lot. (laughs) When you walk into a project, um, you are advising a senior leadership who may have worked 20, 30 years in that company, right? They definitely know more about the business than you know. Yeah. Hands down, right? So that kind of a humble level that, listen, I'm here, I'm not this, like people talk about a consultant should be the smartest person. In the, if you're in the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Uh, you should always be, uh, you know, humble and uh, you should always be willing to learn. And if you have that mindset that, listen, I'm willing to learn, I don't know how to lead and then leaning on other people and have that vulnerability that I'm, you know, doesn't matter if I come from BCG or McKinsey, but I'm here to learn from you of how do you do these better. People will be willing to help you, right? Because uh, the, the, the leadership aspects of the culture, the values of the company, how do you, you know, meander through that? How do you incorporate it in, as you talk to people? Because when you become a leader of, um, uh, in, a, in operations or some like a PNL, your the words you use, your, uh, you know, all, everything matters because everyone's watching you. Right. So that is very important. The second, which is something which is developing or more in leadership is that the idea of servant leadership. You are here not to lead from the front. 
you're actually here to uh, make your team better in whatever they're doing. Because they become better in whatever they're doing, then you have more time to do other things, which will get you accelerated in your career, right? So, so understanding your team, what are they good at? What are they not good at? Augmenting and making sure that the, the, the pathway is clear for them to do their best job will be very helpful for you as you grow through your, uh, you know, becoming somewhat of a general manager. Because general manager is not like, uh, you know, like an army general who's sitting in the front. That kind of corporate culture has gone completely. It's too complex. Uh, like there's too much data in every kind of business. So you have to become more of like, how am I going to make my team better? And what are the obstacles they have? And how I'm going to figure out how to clear those obstacles? Because then they will do uh, whatever... Um, you know, they have to do, and then your work will become super easy. And then giving credit wherever it is required. No one in corporate world now looks at like, like, oh, I did it myself. And I think they know that you can't do it. It's, it's the business is too complex. So th- if you have that kind of mindset, it will help you to sustain, grow, and hopefully reach to whatever ambition you have. Okay. Now, uh, you had, Sab, you had how many years of work experience before you, when you applied to Darted? I had, um, so when I started Darden, I had about three years and two months. Okay. Uh, but when I started applying to business school, I would have like two years okay. you know, of consulting experience. Yeah. So there are two different models, Sab. One is people finish their undergrad at 2021 and they jump into I'm Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Calcutta. And the other mm-hmm. model says that you work for three to four years, start looking at international MBA programs. H- how would you compare these two models? Sap? How would you compare it, an Indian MBA with an international MBA and the one that comes with the work experience versus the one that says, hey, um, uh, you're done with your education by the time you're 23, ready to be shipped and do whatever you want to do in the world. H- how are these two different? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I was very fortunate um, of, uh, to, you know, have like I am in calls um, and ISB, I, I've had admits for them and uh, international MBA. So I was able to kind of look at both. The thing about I am, if you have work experience, it's, it's, it's a hard place to go because the people are it's still in their school education. They have no real life experience. So you're not going to learn anything from them, to be honest. It will, whatever they will tell you is a bookish knowledge and understanding the concept. And in many ways, I am, and things are changing. Business school education in India has changed tremendously, you know, when we were applying in 2005 to now 2020, right? Uh, the exposure is very different. Uh, when I was in college, like there was, there was no McKinsey hiring, BCG, you know, BCG wasn't even there, I believe, in 2002, 2003. So it's a very different world uh, from when we were in undergrad to now. So that my experience is colored by that. Uh, but it's um, the, the it, it, they produce analysts. So they are really good analysts to get into uh, company. So even when uh, BCG or McKinsey hires, to be honest, they don't hire at the associate level, which is what our consultant level, which is post MBA. They hire in a one level lower than a, uh, post MBA, then we call them junior associates. So that's uh, that's how the IM kind of uh, uh, hiring process. I think I, uh, it is it is a good way to kind of learn um, and get into a business education if that's your you know to get a stamp. Uh, the thing is, the what I learned through discussions and learning from in which is the international MBA provides. Is that work experience and those discussions has so much richness in learning because you don't, to be honest, you don't learn from the books. You remember business school, right? You learn from the discussions and to what people can bring from their experiences. And that also stays in your mind and which you can refer, you know, I can sometimes refer back to some of our conversations and through the cases and say, okay, you know, I remember, you know, this, this problem and it has stayed in my mind. If you now ask me a concept like verbatim, I have no idea. That's, uh, and that's the thing in a lot of times in Indian education is about learning concepts and then saying it out loud rather than saying, taking a step back and flying. 
And U.S. education or international MBA is all about application. You know, uh, it's not about how fast you can calculate um, uh, on certain thing or on the paper. And and trust me, it, it's it's important. But automation is going to take care of those things. The person who will be successful in this new age of uh, work is a person who can think differently at certain things, can look at data differently, can come up with new ideas because our AI or the machine learning of the world has not figured out how to make create better ideas. It's more into the world of take a certain kind of process and then make it um, replicable, which is always better than a human in many cases. So that's and that kind of a skill set is I feel like in Indian MBAs is still not there because it's all about competition and uh, this, even the selection process, right? I remember at that time we didn't have so many IMs, but uh, it was like what two hundred fifty thousand people would take uh, the test, and then five thousand people will get. You know, I remember I was like ninety nine point one percentile uh, on that test. Who cares? At the moment, in the international MBA, it is more about knowing the person and and then trying to you know gauge are you going to be a good fit into the classroom. I don't think through the GD interview process they were gauging uh, my fit into the classroom. They were thinking, okay, can this person get a job and you know my numbers can look good because that is how your recruiting process is also developed, right? Zero day minus minus one day, one day, two day, and you are forced into you can only select five. We no one made our restrictions like restriction. I remember there were a couple of classmates who had investment job, banking offers, consulting offers, Google offers, and then they were thinking, "What is my right fit?" And then taking that job, and that is great for even companies because you don't want that person who comes in. Like I remember friends who had Goldman um, and uh, Lehman. You know, I was in a consulting firm. A lot of my friends were in I am. Um, and they didn't know what part of Goldman they were going to. They did not know it was investment banking, <laughs> equity research, uh, wealth management. Uh, and can, can you imagine a US, uh, like you don't know what your job entails? Uh, that was the case. And then they were through the, uh, through the training process, then they were slotted into, some people went into equity research, some people went to investment banking, some people went to fixed income. It, you know, that that kind of naivety is never there in the United States because you're applying for, even at Goldman, the wealth management position, you're applying for the investment banking position, the fixed income desk, which I don't know if it exists anymore, but, uh, but I'm just saying that that's kind of how it is. So there is a huge difference and you need to have that mindset that, uh, that through your business school process and international MBA, you're going to learn about the business. Just saying, I want to work for Goldman, it's... It's great, but you're not going to get that in through international MBA. And here's my last question for you, Sap. What suggestions, blank check, anything, what suggestions do you have for people who are looking at uh, top global MBA programs who want to leave their uh, country, move out, explore the world for next 700 and mm-hmm. all? What would you suggest they do? Ah, oh, that's such a <laughs> open-ended question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, I think, I think in some ways you have to map out why, you know, the why MBA and why, why international MBA and why not? So the, uh, another aspect of, uh, you know, the question of the IMs versus international MBA is that if you want to stay in India, you may or may not want to do an international MBA because why spend so much? Um, you know, and get that experience, even though international MBAs coming back to the country are doing better. You know, we have classmates, uh-huh. right? Uh, Flipkart. Yeah, they have, we have created Flipkart. Udan is, you know, one of our classmates uh, from business school. So, uh, so it, you know, they have done better and that exposure does give you a leg up. But, uh, you know, there's a financial commitment to it. So if you really um, are... T- you have to with it. Why are you doing that MBA? Why an international MBA uh, matters? I think if for me, um, you know, you have to go with the mindset that the world is a global place. May the right wings come in and try to create walls, or uh, ultimately, world is becoming a very democratized 
because of the technology. Technology is just making all the walls disappear, right? Uh, you can get now information uh, about the Uyghurs in China or what happens in Japan in like milliseconds. And it is overwhelming in some cases. Uh, I have to switch off you know, television. I can't watch news for more than 10 minutes uh, because it's so much information. Even in the United States and Indian news channels are pretty crazy. Uh, so, so that, you know, why are you doing that? World is a global place. You need, and you need to learn about different cultures to really diff- understand what people are thinking. If you don't, you know, it's easy to read a book about America or it's easy to read a book about, you know, Sweden or things, but, you know, talking to the person, understanding where their values come from, what does their health system drive? It makes you a better global citizen and it makes you a better business person because when you come back to India, you can actually, even if your ambition is to come back to India, you can take all that knowledge and apply in from a different point of view, which a person who has only have, has an exposure, singular exposure of India may or may not get, right? Uh, I, I, I remember, you know, <laughs> like, Salaries are such a big thing in India. Like, uh, you know, in I am one crore they got, two crore they got, and it's like a big celebration. I don't think we knew who made what salaries coming out of business school. Yeah. Like, if there's a, they they print it, but who is the individual? What they are making, no one uh, really knows. And you know that Harvard person and a Darden person in a consulting firm makes the same salary. Yeah, uh, it, it's not differentiated by the by the firm. It, uh, firm or the business school you're coming in those kinds of things kind of go away because and the international MBA is more enriching in that sense that you're really there to learn figure out what you want to do in your life even though most of us who came out of business school three four years uh, out of business school changed our careers but it was we were making informed decisions rather than just saying oh the top 10 goes to goldman this five goes to McKinsey, this one goes to there, not knowing why they're going to the firm because that is the job which will give me the biggest salary. I don't think uh, we all made those decisions based on the salary. Yes, salary comes in play because you have to pay your loans and everything, but it's more about what is that job going to enrich me and how am I going to make an impact in the world? So if you can figure those things out, your MBA education will be much much more better because you know i if i look back i was super naive right you remember uh i was super young i you know i was like okay i have to top in my class i'm i come from a certain background i have to you know and i missed out in the first six seven months in those enrichment of those conversations because i was like buried in the books trying to you know uh do well in those cases but forgetting that the learning doesn't come from the classroom the learning comes from talking to people and learning about people and their experiences and and you know that switch maybe came in my the second half of my first year and i actually became a better citizen for my business school and i'm uh and because whatever you always take out of any kind of profession life anything of what you put in if you put in that effort in the right way uh, you are going to learn 10 times but you put in that effort thinking that with a certain outcome it may or may not happen and then you'll be disappointed. So that, that kind of naivety, many of us from India have because we are in such a hyper competitive environment and we are um, certain milestones that defines our life. That, um, that mindset has to change and international MBA completely changes that mindset. I remember, so uh, I remember 2006 in one of the classes where somebody, one of our friends from India, uh, so we were discussing, uh, we were doing a case with, I, I think, Ken Eads on finance. And uh, mm-hmm. he had a figure projected on the, sc- uh, on the board. And they said, somebody said 85%, 88%. This one person got up. He said, no, actually, I think it's 84.735%. And Ken Eads said, shut up. Let's assume it's 90%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And move on. Yeah. Let's look at the bigger picture. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and and precision. Uh, yeah, that's the thing because look at the bigger picture, learn from there, and and international MBA. Ultimately, you know, having whatever said that, business school education in United States is still 
a research in the concepts which you learn are way way uh, ahead even consulting for that matter the like um, we having done consulting in india and consulting in the united states the cons- uh, all the research and all the ideas come from united states then they get a way, go to india after they become successful in the united states and those kinds of uh, new cases you start selling in india so if you want to be in with the cutting edge and you really, really want to be where thinking is ahead you know yes there is a lot of noise in this political scenario hopefully you know all indications say that we will have a somewhat of a normal government in november um so people who are applying for next year shouldn't worry about right. what is going to happen you know next year or thing this is this show has is going to end because it has completely um <laughs> you know people are embarrassed uh now there there will be people who will vote for this this administration and that's true and everything but hope our hope is that humanity is going to rise and they're going to make the right decision because i i have a true belief in the positiveness of our hum, our human beings um uh, so so the the research in and the amount of money we spend in in universities the reason why you uh, mba is expensive is we you know in universities in the united states they are constantly thinking of the next big idea they are researching they are spending money on that that's why education is so ex- expensive here and then you and there is obviously the infrastructure and everything aspect of it and administration costs but you can get access to that and then you can leverage that throughout your career which i don't know if, uh, how much research we do in uh, outside of isro and maybe a little bit in indian mbas the research dollars are nowhere close to what happens in the united states so you can you can ne- uh, you can never go wrong from the learning aspect but it is a financial risk there are no guarantees in life um so being open to that that if that does not work out what is my option uh my second uh, option a third option and you know the you know like we graduated in 2008 the smartest of the people had such difficult times right you got consulting offers and then you were asked to you know they were you were laid off and yeah was yeah. there something wrong with them nothing it, you know life happens you can't predict it well thank you so much sap it is a it's been a pleasure to have you here a lot of people tons and tons of applicants across the world are going to get a lot of value especially not just people who are looking for consulting careers but people who are currently thinking of whether or not to explore international mba thank you thank you thank you so much for your time sap thank you